You're listening to Raising Anchor, a Rhode Island FC podcast. We're glad you're here. Hello and welcome to Raising Anchor, your podcast and source for all things Rhode Island FC. I'm your host, Matt Entrickin, coming to you on Thursday, April 4th. We'll try to sort out exactly what happened in RIFC's first ever Eastern Conference matchup that led to a 4-1 loss at Alling Field. Is it time to panic? Plus, we'll get you ready for our second ever home match this Saturday as we take on a team that's moving in a completely different direction on the table, the Charleston Battery. Can RIFC get its first ever win in front of a home crowd? To help me figure that out is co-host Jason Carey. Jason, how is it going, my friend? And how is the weather over there? Oh, it's great. Uh, we're going through, what is this called, third winter or something? It's like 39 degrees outside. I mean, where I am, it's a nice 76 and some haziness. So I, I don't know if maybe, if, if it wasn't for soccer, I'm, I'm having a hard time finding a reason to come back right now. <laughs> I mean, you did go on your secret mission to find Brett Johnson, so. No, yeah, it was, he, was, he was a lot of fun. Uh, for those of you that haven't listened to that interview yet, highly encourage. It will most likely be one of our number one listened episodes in the history of the podcast. Already lots of positive praise and some controversy. Uh, had a couple of people reach out and say uh, some not so nice things. I, I don't really understand. I feel like and I've heard this sentiment around that there are just some naysayers and some doom scrollers that, you know, do not want to see the state of Rhode Island succeed at anything. They're just happier in the negativity and, and the and the bad mind space. Uh, but I had nothing but positive things to say. I had nothing but positive interactions. And uh, for any of you that have been on the fence on whether or not Brett Johnson is the real deal, I can tell you everything he's doing is 100% invested in seeing Rhode Island FC succeed so uh, i can't wait to see him back out at his next opportunity to come out watch a home match i think it might be phoenix rising but he said that he's kind of in between right now with the likes of ipswich town so close to uh promoting themselves back to the english premier league so it'll be interesting to see how that kind of works out but uh excited when he comes back out and we can't wait to have him back on the pod in the near future he's he's definitely uh one of the one of the best guys that we've had a chance to sit down and talk with so far yeah that uh I think that was probably one of our best interviews there, or your best interviews. It w- it came out really good. I I love that it. One of our best is when you're not in the equation. <laughs> Speaking of not being in the equation, I know that you got the chance to go to the German American Culture Society in the Rathskeller with the likes of the uh, supporters group and Rhode Island FC in a first time ever collaboration. Uh, how was that? How was Chip? How m- minus the game, which we'll obviously unpack. How was that whole experience? Yeah, it was it was good. Um, you know, we've been there a few other times to uh see some other stuff, but it was really nice to see the place packed. Um Chip came out and celebrated when we did score our goal and kind of danced in front of the, of the group and um you know, overall despite the game, like you said, we'll get into it, but I think that uh it was a there's pretty good vibes there. Um I am curious though because Providence Brewing was like, hey, this was a this was a lot of fun when they did their their first watch party. They did another one. I wonder how theirs turned out. Yeah, I I expect more of that to come as bars as businesses partner with the club and start to see those those connections. Uh, there's a question that we have in the mailbag for today's episode about you know what is the game plan to kind of detach from those central viewership parties uh, where people can't make it necessarily to the one experience so I, I think there's some more conversation there to be had i am curious if that's going to be a thing for providence or if you know the numbers aren't there because it wasn't officially sponsored by the club it's definitely something to consider but either way as these bars and these restaurants come more online with the idea of hosting events it's just exciting to see them participating and uh and throwing the throwing the rafc awareness out to the masses yeah, I th- I think we'll we'll slowly start to see uh, more and more of those here and there popping up. So then, my real question to you is: Did we lose that game because I wasn't there to watch it with you, or because you predicted a three three draw? Maybe I don't know. Maybe it was because I said for the memes. <laughs> you know, I, I'm not gonna lie. When the game when the game started getting out of our control and we were at three one, 
I started hoping for the three three draw just so that you know one we'd get one point out of it, and two it would allow you to uh, to continue your Nostradamus run, but was not meant to be. Um, so glad you had a good time. Uh, for those of you that didn't go to the watch party or haven't been to a watch party, I highly encourage you connect for the next one, uh, which right now is looking like it will probably be the Open Cup. Uh, but before we get to that, just a couple of other, other things. Speaking of the Open Cup, terrible news to see Vermont Green get knocked out. I was worried that they were going to advance to round three and then we were going to end up facing them uh, because, you know, you don't want to see... You don't want to see your club become the one that dethrones uh, a Cinderella story like what was going on up there in Vermont. So, unfortunately, they're no longer continuing, so now we can focus on the businesses of getting drawn in. But before we go to the Open Cup, I just want to celebrate. Congratulations to the winners of this week's uh, four-pack of tickets and a parking pass. Uh, That's going to be Tim Sheldon. Uh, I don't know which of the platforms that he participated in. I collected them all. I couldn't do one of those little wheels like we did for the the jersey giveaway because I just haven't had time as I'm traveling. So, Tim, uh, you should have already gotten a DM. We'll post it in the socials tomorrow as well. Just a little running, running a little behind on that. But congratulations to you. Jason, are you ready to are you ready to do this? Ready to talk about Open Cup Madness? It is here and it is ready for us to be consumed by it. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, the draw was on uh, YouTube today at, what, 1 p.m.? Something like that? You know, I've never watched... I, well, I should say this. I watch very few Open Cup games, but I have never watched a seeding or draw lottery for an Open Cup. That Like, seeing the Discord all of a sudden randomly light up and everyone freaking out. I have to admit, it was a lot of fun. But at the same time, was that a little bit scripted? Could, there, that could have only gone one other direction, which was if NYCFC hosted, correct? Yeah, so it was really weird the way they did it. Um, they init- they immediately said, hey, RFC is is not going to host. You know, they didn't give the specifics why. I imagine it's because we don't want to because of the deal with Burn. So they set us to the side. And then they set a, um, they pulled the two home teams. And then from there, they were saying, hey, the way this works is Hartford can't, play RAFC so at that point there was no need to do the draw anymore you just say well okay so that means you know Charlotte has to play against uh against us and then New York City has to play against Hartford they didn't need to do that whole rigmarole of opening you know the envelopes for no reason (laughs) Yeah, no, it was, and especially considering the, of course, right, you know, drawn in the stars, they pull Rhode Island FC's card next to line up against Hartford. So they even tease it and say, oh, Hartford Athletic playing Rhode Island FC, except wait, they can't. So that that did seem kind of over the top uh, from that perspective. It seemed like it was destiny. I I understand why they want to do it. You know, you don't want to end up with a tournament, tournament that just has all the small teams because you you need the viewership numbers there I get it but it seemed like it was meant to be they should have just let it happen yeah and for those of you that are new or have not been paying attention to the format um like Jason said it, the USL championship clubs cannot in this round uh square off against each other there's a a ladder system so that the winners of rounds 1 and 2 have to play the entry participants to round 3 now, if both teams make it into round four, there is a chance and a very strong likelihood based on the fact that they still kind of keep it as regional as possible that we could see Hartford if both of our teams advance. Uh, but one other thing that you said that I want to make sure that we also touch on for our newer listeners, there is a likelihood that we will not see the club in year one host any U.S. Open Cup matches. Uh, they haven't come out right and said that, but there has been conversations that like you said, there's a logistical nightmare going on with Burn Stadium at Bryant University. When you think about all of the effort they had to put into to establishing the regular season, that is still a working college. And so for Bryant to accommodate us, a lot of other things have been slotted into the weekdays. And that's normally where the U.S. Open Cup lives until it hits that September timeline as the tournament winds down. So you'll see you know, the likeliness of it competing with a lacrosse practice or a women's soccer match. So it's just not in the cards for us to host. Now, that being said, if the club gets close, especially with a CONCACAF berth on the line and we make a deep run, I could see them kind of back 
peddling that a little bit to say, hey, what are the opportunities? But for the time being, expect us to be road warriors for this Open Cup. Expect us to be going to our opponents and trying to take the uh, the knockout win and, and advancing. So if we do see Hartford in round four, it's it's going to be in Hartford and not uh, in Rhode Island. So again, that I said it earlier in the in the season that our first derby would be actually at Hartford for the Open Cup. I got that wrong. I think one of our fans educated me on on the way it lines up. But if we both advance into round four and there's some there's some collusion in the scheduling, especially how we've seen the likes of the U.S. Open Cup put those derbies out there for other MLS teams. We could see the derby happen for, uh, before the regular season matchup. It's written in the stars. It's bound 100%. to happen. A hundred percent. So, and then again, we will be traveling to Charlotte Independence, uh, and we'll be facing the former USL Championship, now USL side one team, on Tuesday, April sixteenth at seven p.m. The Defiance Supporters Group is working to quickly get a watch party together. Uh, it's going to be TBA on whether that's at the Guild. Again, that's another scheduling thing where they weren't aware of it. So anticipate something to go out on social media eventually from both the club and for the supporters group. Uh, that will be a that will be a fun time no matter what because you know this is our first time in this this historic trophied tournament and you know we have to show up whether it's the club shows up or we show up we we have to show up as fans yeah with all the noise that a lot of the um supporters of smaller teams have been making you know ourselves included this is definitely something that we need to show up and show support for to show that you know this this really is an important historic tournament in US soccer and you know to be honest because it's a midweek game and with our schedules and the fact that it's Tuesday there's more than likely we won't be covering it from a true preview perspective uh we may jump on one of the other teams or the other podcast groups and just help kind of cover it uh but er, you know early question for you Jason just on the initial thoughts on this matchup is this something that you think is a is a pushover for us do you think this is something that we need to take serious and not just assume that you know we're the bigger, badder, tougher team? Uh, we definitely need to take this serious. Um, I think in in a way it's good for us to, for all intents and purposes, have a lesser team as an opportunity to play, especially as those of you know, you know we, we've not won a game yet. We're maybe struggling a little bit. Um, so, so to have one of these lesser opponents maybe gives you that opportunity to... Uh, to maybe build some confidence and pick up a win. But at the same time, you know that they are going to go into this match wanting to go for it as well. Agreed. I mean, you live for the cup the cup set, right? So uh, excited. Can't wait to see what happens. And uh, just waiting for the Amber, the boys in Amber and Blue to, uh, to step up and do their thing. So can't wait. Excited for those of you that are going to join us to watch that game. Let's move into some of the other big news for the week. Uh, it cap it happened right after we did the podcast in classic fashion. I'm pretty convinced now that the club does this intentionally because they know our recording schedule. We we work with them as much as possible to get the information. They're just we trolling need. us a hundred percent. So on Friday, uh, before the Tampa Bay game, of course, they announced the signing of Colin Smith. Uh, he wearing the number four. He's the 20 year old from Jacksonville, Florida, and uh, he comes from a pretty pretty big soccer pedigree when you look at the development academies that he's been through. He comes from the Dallas Academy, which we've seen the likes of, you know, Weston McKinney, Ricardo Pepe, um, Jesus Ferreira, Reggie Cannon. You know, he, he, he's he been playing and he's been training uh, in his youth with some of the most up-and-coming players within the U.S. men's national system. And it's, it, it's a really interesting story. There's a part of me that kind of wants to put the tinfoil hat on this guy and say, like, how we ended up picking him up is a bit of a controversy at the end of the day it's not but colin smith is the real deal one he's played in mls that's right the the senior league not just the next pro system he's played in usl one and he's most recently played in the usl championship with none other than birmingham legion which surprise that's the connection to coach Cano. on top of that he's got experience in the open cup he they got knocked out by messi's inner miami before Messi joined the squad. That that would have been a probably fun time if he had been able to be there when that happened, but Messi hadn't joined yet. Uh, and then he he got a taste of USL Championship playoffs last year as Birmingham made a short but nevertheless uh, run in the championship uh, playoff system. And so he's got kind of a good 
he's got a good skill set of experiences under his feet. And so after Birmingham, he finds himself uh, moving to the Revs 2 this season, signed in January, plays one game with them, they lose, and then he dips and comes and joins us. And I Loss I, was that bad, he just had to leave. <laughs> I well, so I mean, and all jokes aside, right? Because you know, we have to be I don't want to say sensitive, but this is one of those moments where we try not to compare leagues because again, MLS Next Pro would be your division three. We are division two, and then of course Rev Senior are division one. It's not a fair comparison to say the likes of one is the same as the other. However, he is by moving to Rhode Island FC making a declaration that he has more faith in his skills and that he will get the playing time and the quality of playing time that he needs playing with the likes of our squad versus the dotted line that could get him from the Revs to, to the Revs senior squad. And, you know, the revolution, they, they are struggling in some of their defensive sided players with the likes of Brandon by who's still injured. Uh, and so like, I wouldn't say their right back is locked down. So if if Colin had shown up well early, there could have been a chance for him to make that move. He was more confident and had more faith in Kano as an individual to come join our squad after he'd already signed a contract, had it mutually terminated between him and the Revs too, and is now playing for us here in Rhode Island FC. I, I, I don't want to overplay that, but at the same time, I don't want to understate that the viability of, of, a, of a team like ours a league like ours, it's not something to just dismiss. He got what fifteen minutes or so in the game, and you know, it wasn't a lot. We were we were not in good shape when he joined in, but I think he looked pretty good. Um, you know, I think that's a good call out that you said um, about him maybe not particularly having faith in where he was. You know, MLS Next Pro is what Division Three, so Kano, from what I get doesn't just go out and make signings for no reason, right? He maybe thinks that he can push the starters to perform because we haven't had a consistent lineup. I know there's been a lot of injuries, but if you have someone right behind you in training well, you know that you need to show up because if not, you're going to get dropped. You know, I look at I looked at Smith's tape and I couldn't help but wonder if he he seems more defensive um then like maybe say the the likes of what Turnbull brings as a wing back. Yeah, um, I, I was kind of thinking about that too. So you have him and Alves who are the let's say the more defensive minded fullbacks. Which by the way, Alves Turnbull and Quizera. a left back for Birmingham as well last year. So now you have anchors on both sides of that kind of cornered <laughs> fullback strategy, right? So like there's already a synergy that, again, the rule of two, right? There's a synergy there in that aspect. I didn't mean to cut you off, but that, that was one of those things that I didn't, I didn't realize until I started writing the stats and looking at this guy. I think that also gives us some more opportunities going forward to, um, you know, maybe look at our formation and maybe even look at tactics wise. I, I think it's still er too early. We'll, we'll get into it here when we get into the match recap, but maybe what, what we got going on right now is, isn't doing too well for us. I don't know. So do you think this is one of those things where we keep, you know, we allow Turnbull just to go bananas for 65 minutes and, you know, just burn all of his his stamina to try to, because again, at this club, you can say what you want, but we love to go out and get the first, you know, the first goal. And maybe not so much in the New Mexico game, even though we were dominant in the in the attempt to get the goal, it just didn't kind of go our way. But in these last two games, we're not afraid to go out on the road and secure that first goal. And part of that comes with that aggressiveness, which, like you said, we'll talk about. Is this the likes of we see Turnbull continue to do what Turnbull's doing, and then we get those late defensive subs to kind of start containing and closing out a game? Or do you do it the other way? You start the game kind of cagey, size up the opponent, and then, oh, uh, we need the goal, or we just need to put more pressure in the right place. And then, you know, we bring a Turnbull on in, say, the 70th minute and just let him just tear apart you know, the wing defense uh, for our opponents. Like, I mean, I know it's too early, but if you were the coach right now, which which way would you go with it? I think that I would probably rather sub them in late. Like, you Who's know, they? If, uh, uh, the defensive, the defensive minded. Got it. Um, you know, as much as I think that coach doesn't want to like change his tactics and not always kind of be on the front foot and attack, 
there is a certain point, like you mentioned, where, you know, some of these guys might just get gassed. If the game, let's say the game had gone differently down in Tampa, say it's the 65th minute and we're still up 1-0, maybe you sub the fullbacks out, get the defensive ones in there, and kind of maybe sit back a little bit. And from there, you know, try and move forward when you can, but at the same time, you want to try and protect that those three points you have. So let's talk about it. Let's move into the, the recap of the Tampa Bay game, because I think that's going to be the focal point of this conversation for today's episode. You know, first, uh, to get the obvious out of the way, Rhode Island falls to Tampa Bay in the highest single match combination of total goals this season for either team. Um, and I have a special shout out. I, I was listening to the broadcast. I was actually watching the game on my cell phone with my son as we were waiting to go watch the LA Galaxy. In a, we were in the parking lot, hanging out, doing a watch party for Rhode Island FC. We probably had like five or six people just show up because they were like, why are these people screaming at their phones over here? And then we went in and watched another game. So I got like double the soccer for the night. But having said that, uh, listening to the broadcast, Ryan Davis, incredible broadcaster. I had heard his name. I had heard his voice watching some of the other matches. But this dude is, uh, his story is incredible. He wasn't even a broadcaster like four years ago. He's from Trinidad and Tobago. And just like the way he sounds and the color commentary he puts on it, he reminds me of like the early stages of a Ray Hudson. And I kind of thought that he was like a Jamaican Ray Hudson, but like toned down a little bit. <laughs> whitest guy you'll ever meet, by the way. <laughs> nice. Super like just overall nice dude. So like I if I were to watch a team strictly for the audio commentary, uh highly encourage. It's it was a good time. So I just want to get that out because as a broadcaster myself, so to speak, with this podcast I respect people that put time into the craft, and Ryan Davis deserves a shout-out. So let's get into this formation. More of the same, but also not. We saw the 3-5-2 again for its third showing for Red Island FC. The difference here, Lee starts the game, obviously for the injured Koke, and then we see McGlynn continue in that uh, st that center midfield role but with the captain's armband this time so so mcglynn gets the captain's ar nod and then we we answer the question of where will clay holstead enter this team and you and i spent way too much time last week trying to unpack in the triangle between joe brito connor mcglynn and clay holstead like who would give and it was none of them it was clay holstead to the back line similar to what we saw at providence college where he replaces Frank Nodarce, which I'm confused because Frank did not in any way show to me a poor performance on any of the matches that I've seen him play. Yeah, I think he actually had a really good game against Monterey Bay. So we see Holstead now drop more into a center back line after having all of this creativity and offensive prowess. I got to ask you, what like what was going like what was going on in your mind when you saw that? Obviously, what was going on is you saw the game unfold. Did the did the Holstead at center left back work? Uh, I, you know, knowing the result, I would say no. Um, I just don't think it suits him. Obviously, he seems comfortable there. Um, you know, he can kind of rotate, but I think he's way more effective in the midfield. He did make that great tackle that saved, a, you know, potentially another goal that might have been scored on us that was named the RI Energy Play of the Game. Which, can we talk but, about that? You, <laughs> you can't have your sponsor play in an away game. I'm sorry. I, I, I'm not yeah, trying I to fight know. the club here, but, like, that is a home participation event. Like, that is not something you do for every... Yeah, I don't, I don't think that's something you're supposed to do. I guess... You know, Got to get those no advertising rule. dollars. There's, there's no rule book on it, right? You can they can do whatever they want, but ultimately, you know, jumping ahead, considering that you know one of the problems I think we had was the midfield just didn't feel like it was there. I think he really could have helped out. So I, I don't want to go there yet because that was a that was the lion's share of kind of the complaints and the comments that were made by fans this week about the midfield, and and we we unpacked the data. And I think that there's some interesting takeaways that may change people's perspective, or they'll say that I'm crazy, and that's okay too. So I, I want to hold for a second and get through the rest of like the initial recap. 
So, yeah, and I agree, by the way. Holstead did not seem... It wasn't that he wasn't capable, but it just seemed like he was underutilized, underutilized in yeah. that role. So Tampa Bay sets up in their 3-4-2-1. And then the big changes for the week for them were, were of course, you know, we say Damon Rivera is going to be a threat, and he gets moved to a sub. He gets put to the bench so that uh, Leo Fernandez can re-enter the team. The former 2022 MVP, who I'm pretty sure Kano was scouting to join our club, I can't commit like that I have confirmed sources for that, but I would I think we were sizing to see if that was someone we wanted to pick up. Uh he was injured most of twenty twenty three and is just now getting back into starting minutes with Tampa Bay. Uh so he's he joins and replaces Rivera. So now you've got someone as lethal as Rivera in a super sub opportunity. And then uh Eddie Monjoma, who also from the Dallas Academy who played with Colin Smith. He makes his debut at uh, right mid. He can play right mid or right back. So those were the two big kind of threats for for Tampa. And listen, you know, in the last week's game, we did the whole recap play by play. I kind of want to move away from that because one, you've you've either had a week to think about this or forget about the match. Let's get honest, right? Especially when with this kind of scoreline, and then two, you know. I, I want to make sure that we offer the commentary that helps people kind of understand what happened, especially with our access when it comes to press. So I don't want to just be like, oh, and then there was a yellow card and this. So for listeners who are already getting used to how we're kind of doing this, we're going to change it all on you guys right now anyways. <laughs> we'll um, still figure it out. Yeah. And we'll probably change it again in like a couple more episodes. So I, I think this was a tale of two halves, right? And in the first half, a couple big things that, that came out to me and you know one i've never seen a yellow card in the usl happen in the first minute of a game and i thought that was really interesting because that kind of set the pace of what uh osmanovic was going to set as tempo for the game he, and you know giving a yellow card uh, on a foul against ibarra told me like okay this is going to like again because rhode island fc has been in a situation where they've been over fouling and over accumulating their yellows to me, it was like a, hey, I am going to call anything and everything. We checked in with Seth the ref. He said it was a valid foul. I, I didn't see it as dangerous. Um, I, I figured you'd at least get like, hey, that was your one warning for the game. But not the case. Have you seen, I, I, I should ask real fast, have you seen that kind of thing happen in the first minute of a game where it's not like egregious? It Sometimes. it It's kind of rare, but. You know, maybe the ref just thought, "Oh, I need, I need to uh, calm this down right away." <laughs> so, so we see the game start out, and and very similar to every other game that we've seen so far, Rhode Island FC comes out with their pedal to the metal. They are aggressively trying to, you know, be goal scoring dangerous. Uh, the difference here, though, is with no Koke in the net, it was a different type of system with the way Jackson Lee was deployed, we were not distributing with that high press and possession out the back to build play or just build uh, attack. It was, it was long balls. Long balls were, were, were on the menu for the night. And you saw pass after pass from Jackson Lee attempting to just completely bypass the play of field and connect with, with Chico or Fusan and just try to make a dangerous goal scoring threat. I thought that was really interesting because we talked, did Lee joining the squad, was that going to change how we played our game? We didn't know at the time, but then when I looked at the the field too, I had a kind of epiphany, and I want to know what you think about this. We used to joke all the time that NYCFC playing in a baseball stadium is a postage stamp. We know how small that is because of the dimensions of a baseball field. Where Tampa Bay plays is also a former baseball field that has been retrofitted for their use. Does that come into play? Like when we go and play in the likes of converted or borrowed baseball fields, do we need to think differently on, because I mean, if Jackson Lee can kick a ball and put it in the final third or, you know, in the, the penalty area of the opposite, the opposing team is that if they can make that pass, like why not try that every time? Yeah, well, so the thing is, the length of the field should always be the same. What you, the the weird part you get is the width. So, like, the NYCFC field was super narrow, as opposed to, like, you look at uh, what the Spotify, Camp New, or the Etihad, or City Play, like, 
they're super wide. And that's because those how the that's how those teams want to play. They want to use all of the field to to stretch their players and make passes. When you get the uh those like really narrow type of fields, which I wasn't really paying attention this time. Maybe that's something we'll have to look at here and there, uh the field dimensions. But you know, you sometimes can't can't play the same way. And and I think that's gonna come into my second piece in the second half where when you look at the heat map and when you look at the distribution, it was all central. I'll, I'll say it now just to get it out of the way, but we'll touch on it in a minute. Steven Turnbull was completely shut out of this game. He had six passes on the night, and only two of them were forward. You can't tell me that a wingback who's supposed to be, you know, all up in the business end of providing attack or chance creation, if he's only making six touches, like, that's not good. And I think that's because the size of the field it, when you, when you play that compact, it limits what you want to do, and I think we saw that uh, in what Tampa Bay knew they were going to do, but also in what Rhode Island FC's game plan was going to be. So that was kind of the first instinct I, I saw, and then of course let's talk about the goal and kind of some of the re- the retaliation or the reply that we saw from Tampa Bay. Obviously, Lee hits Chico. There's a bit of a kind of you know defensive dance as Chico pushes past. Uh, you know, his his last defender and then gets it around the the keeper for Tampa Bay and slots home his third goal and uh, 47th in his career inside the USL uh, to to take us up to the top by the 16th minute. So again, more, I think this game, I think this goal came even sooner than what we saw in Monterey Bay. But again, more of the same of Rhode Island FC being aggressive, going out, securing that first goal, and then no response on how to continue the game management from there. Yeah, Chico kind of caught them sleeping there, and I was surprised none of the uh, defenders tracked him. Maybe they just didn't realize Lee could hit the ball that far. I don't, I don't know. Did you see? Did you see after Chico scored the goal that he, he high fived one of the Tampa Bay defenders? Yeah, I saw that. He was kind of having a laugh with them. I, you know, I mean, nothing wrong. I think. If you kind of admit that, hey, I fell asleep there. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would not be a Tampa Bay defender high-fiving the guy that, that just scored on me. But having said that, so Chico does what Chico does best, and he creates a goal out of, you know, basically nothing. I mean, kudos to Lee. He dropped that he dropped that pass perfectly to where Chico needed to be to collect it. And I think it goes to show what Kano Smith had, had kind of shared about what Chico's capabilities were, that he doesn't need these elaborate combinations to put balls into the back of the net. He can create a lot on his own with the way he makes runs. And I think we're going to see more and more of that this season. What kind of shocked me is again, similar to the Monterey Bay situation of we score. And then a couple of minutes later, Ortega almost answers with a reply of his own as he gets one past the defensive line and up and over on a chip uh, over Lee that bounces off of the woodwork but almost goes in. And it's, it's, it's again, it's, it's a few minutes later and we're almost back to an equalization. I, I, I don't understand. I think that's ultimately just going to be the way that we play. Um, you know, Kano doesn't strike me as someone who, who wants to sit back and defend. We're always going to be going after it. I think, um, you know, maybe the the goal long term would just be able to limit those chances and ultimately score more so that you are winning games. When we're only scoring one or two, giving up this many opportunities, it just doesn't work. I mean, we should should say, though, the first 30 about minutes of the game, RFC played really well, despite, you know, that made that chance we gave up. There was even a few moments where like we were controlling the ball and passing and moving, poking and prodding. And they, they look really comfortable and good on the ball. It wasn't until around the 30th minute that Tampa seemed to kind of start to get into the game and, and what felt like maybe a 10 minute onslaught there from the 30th to the 40th of, you know, it, them kind of really putting the pedal to the metal. Yeah. But is that more of, and again, I'm not a coach, but, when you've got 
control of the game and you know that your high press attacking system is also high risk high reward isn't there a way that you can get both out of it where if you're up one i'm not saying go defensive in your shape or in your mindset but there's a way to play and manage your minutes safely to where you can you you don't have to be as explosive and and if, and if that's because this team's not gelled yet they're not comfortable or like you said, if Kano has one mindset and it's attack, attack, attack. I, I just, you know, I, I didn't see us, again, and we, we talked about this in the Monterey Bay game. I didn't see those, hey, let's let's just play it safe. Let's just, let's just pass a ball back and reset and see if we can find something down the other flank. Again, Turnbull had six passes on the night. Six passes. Like, you're not using him in any way to contain or manage how you want to start your attack a majority of our passes went through Connor McGlynn. And that's if they went through it all because our midfield was, to a certain extent, non-existent. I just have to, I have to ask, is, is it not something that we can make adjustments on the fly, especially when we now kind of control the tempo or the game? We can. I, I just think that we, we don't know exactly what, the tactics are that Kano is trying to employ. And we talked about this, I think in the last pod, we're still not sure. Like, are we a possession team? Are we a counter team? I think realistically, if we had to, to make it simple to make for comparison wise, I think we're more of a, let's say like a Liverpool as opposed to a man city. I don't think we really want to hold on to the ball and just kind of, past the team other team to death i think we want to you know get the ball move it forward and try and create opportunities and score and you've seen that with a with the recent resurgence of liverpool under jurgen klopp at times they can they can give up a lot of goals too granted when you have you know some of the best defenders and goalkeepers in the world behind you that that's really going to help so maybe this is just us needing to kind of, you know, solidify our defense, make sure that they work on their communication, understanding, you know, just in general, I, I think I'll, the team is still kind of finding their feet. So let, let's talk about that, because I think this team is starting to show what they intend to be when we talk about play style. You know, originally, I didn't think it was possession, and, and sometimes it doesn't feel like it. You know, in this game, we didn't do that combination of playing out the back to build the offense. But what this team is, is it's a high-pressing team that doesn't want to lose the ball outside of their opponent's half, right? So, and, and to just kind of like tie into the complaints that we heard all week about there was no midfield, that's not true. There was a midfield in this game. The problem was is that they were, along with the striker core, up in the opposition half and that included our wing backs so what we saw was a almost 60 percent possession on the night and i would challenge anyone who watched that game to say there's no way we had 60 percent possession but that it was 58.5 percent we dominated possession in that game and when you look at where all of that happened it happened in tampa bay's side and so what you would see is, is you would see this containment or you would see these quick passes while trying to unlock something against Tampa Bay that would not that would not necessarily get us anywhere but nevertheless we would see all of those combinations happen. So we had a total of 168 passes yet 91 of those were in the op the opposing half. So this wasn't something where we sat back on our own side. We kept it aggressive. We kept it pushed up. When you look at the passes in the final third, it was 48. So, like, again, half of those passes were basically knocking on the door of Tampa Bay. This is a team that does not want to relent. They want to keep it high. They want to keep it tight. And they want to make sure that everything happens in their opponent's half. And, unfortunately, when we lose the ball, as we saw on the night, we are just completely susceptible to the counter. We're completely susceptible to any type of breakout play. But Kano wants this ball to never be in his in his half of the field. That 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 at least for now is what we can say is the order on the on the day. Yeah, so maybe that is just the team needing to to understand that they are going to get countered. 
and how do they try and defend those better? But it, but does this that is work? the way they want to play? I I don't know. <laughs> I mean, the jury is still out, as they say. I just I find it hard to see like after three games, we now have more goals against than four. And again, like you said, if this if the order is Kano wants to outscore the other team, it has to reflect that on the score line. Like if we lost this game three to four, okay, it's it's a work in progress. But when you lose four to one, like you you have to answer for that defensive requirement. And I don't know that this formation does that just yet. It's great that we have these numbers in this side of the possession of of that final third and on the opponent's side. But if it's not leading to goals, and so far we can combine to score as many as two goals in one game, that's our that's our upper ceiling at this time. I mean, even sometimes two goal score games is not enough to to put it away for the day. True, but I mean, they really only Tampa Bay only generated what like one point five xg or something, and if you go back and look at those goals, like what the third goal was like a really well executed set piece. Like that was a good goal. I don't think anyone could have done anything about that, but like the fourth goal, you know, one of our defenders tries to like, you know, header it backwards and it's just does not do it very well. I don't think he realized there's runners coming in behind. Um, There was the one that I forget who it was. They, they whiffed the clearance. So, I mean, like at the end of the day, I don't, I'm not going to argue that we did enough to win this game, but like we could have lost like two one, you know. Yeah, and if like, we were listen, just kind of on our game. And so listen, to say. some of those some of those defensive mistakes were not bad strategy or bad shape. They were errors, right? They were mistakes by the players. I think it's fair to say that Mark Ibarra did not have a good showing on the day, uh, both from the attempted clearance that he misses and that results in. A goal, as well as not marking the likes of uh, Tampa Bay's, uh, what was his name, Jordan Doherty, uh, on his set-piece attack. You know, he was just behind on the opposite side. We need to improve set-piece defending. I don't think that's anything that is new uh, inside the space. So, yes, there were players that had bad touches on the day. And and not every time you're going to see the success of it all working, right? But again, it's that only scoring one goal. If we made two mistakes that led to two goals, the team can work collectively together to get out of it. And that just didn't feel like it was the case today. Yeah, and it, like like you mentioned, tale of two halves. At the end of the first half, we came out up 1-0. You know, it seemed like we were struggling a little bit at the end, but we got through. Second half... You know, Tampa Bay seems like a like a different team, or to a certain extent, maybe they carried some of that momentum just straight through. I, and I have to ask, you know, you say the second half is this a tale of Tampa Bay adjusting at the half, and Rhode Island didn't do that themselves? Is this Cano trying to do more of the same? You know, you look at it from the perspective of at the half it was one zero. Was Cano going into that saying, "Don't change anything"? It's been it's been dangerous. It's been close, but we're still pulling off what we need to accomplish. And because Tampa Bay was the team that was down, they made the adjustments that we couldn't we couldn't cope with. It's it's hard to say. Um, you know that that first goal they scored was kind of sloppy defending on our part. Um, when I saw it live, I kind of thought it was offsides. Going back and reviewing it later. It seems very close, and you know, it's probably fair. Yeah. So um, Seth, Seth, the ref actually used basically goal line technology uh, in his assessment of the game. We're still going to work on how we can incorporate him into the podcast. He put his refing career on the line and said that that was as onsides as it could be, or it was so close that an AR would never, never call that in any day. In fact, Seth even said that the only the only call of the night that was bad was the foul against uh, Chico in the like 53rd or 50, 55th minute um, that got a player on uh, Tampa Bay, uh, Gullion, uh, a yellow card when he went back and watched it, the way that Chico moves the ball at the last second and then how he comes through Chico late from behind and then scissors the leg 
uh, that should have been a red card. And but but Seth even said in the moment and the way that like Chico kind of just got up afterwards. I think if Chico sold that a little bit more, maybe there would have been a different opinion. Um, but he understood that it was a yellow. But it you know that that break that kind of move breaks bones. That should have been a red. Yeah, I didn't uh, I didn't realize at the time how bad that tackle was. Went back and saw it, and I was like, oh yeah, that's that's not great. Probably should have should have been a different color, but just kind of is what it is at this point. Yeah, so Ortega Ortega equalizes in the second half with a goal that looked exactly like the off the one that went off the woodwork in the first half. So he basically just replicated the same effort and got a different outcome. We see then the likes of Cal Jennings and all three of those players that we said to watch out for. Guess what? They all score goals in this second half. So you got Ortega, you've got Jennings, you've got Doherty, and then of course Damian Rivera. You knew that he would score. They all they all put the, they put it to bed, and it's it's a four one outcome. We look like we got ran off the field. You know wh- what were your final takeaways on the game? So yeah, at, at the end of the day, you know I don't think we did enough to win, but I, it it could have not been as bad as it was. Sometimes, you know, like uh, like Brett Johnson said, you know maybe if the ball's three inches to the left or the right. It's a goal or maybe it's not so it's just kind of one of those things you know talking to some of the fans at the uh the watch party shout out to number 75 um a lot of people still have pretty good outlook for the team so i think they are being understanding that at the end of the day this is a brand new team it, it's hard to be very critical of them when it's our third time ever playing a professional match these things take time. Would you say this is more of us needing to gel and continue? Because again, there are questions now, right? There are questions about the formation. Is this is this not working for the players? Is this is this the need to change formations? Is this just we need more time together as a unit? Um, or is this something that we should be anticipating a change in this Charleston Battery game ahead? That was actually something that um, we were talking about there at afterwards after the match. That I, you know, I don't want to give a hard number, but let's just say after ten matches, maybe you know, we'll we'll know what this team is. So obviously, you want to see incremental changes. I would imagine after this last match, you know, especially at home. Even if it doesn't go the way we want it, you want to see some fight in this team. And you want to see maybe like little improvements and changes here and there. I don't know if I saw a fight in the in the final 20 minutes. I, I feel like we saw a frustrated team that was doing what they could. But, you know, again, with, when we had all of our players up front and a back three that was struggling to do anything, even with then when we brought in the likes of Alves and Colin Smith, which as a positive for the night, Colin Smith looked good for the few minutes that he got. Yeah, he, Alves he did. looked good. Uh, I will say Connor, you know, not just because he was the captain, but Connor had probably some of the best performance on the night, which people will say, well, he was in the midfield and that didn't exist. But his passing game was, was basically the lion's share or the accumulation of almost all of the passing in the Rhode Island FC's time on the pitch that night. Uh, so I, I think I think that those are the positives you could take. Yeah, I mean, I think it's important for us to to get to, you know, have some perspective too, right? Tampa Bay Rowdies are a historic team in U.S. soccer, and they generally are one of the better teams in the league year in, year out. Even though maybe their standing so far this year was not reflecting that, for us to expect to go there and you know, come out with a win. You know, I'm not saying that it's not possible, but I imagine most teams who go go there don't get favorable results. And then I guess I would say there was a lot of ire being thrown towards the likes of Joe Brito and Marky Barra. Is this more of the players' skills and talent, or was this based on the formation and the fact that Tampa had us figured out this game? I, you know, I I I don't want to be too critical of the players just yet. Um, they they have to go through a lot of travel too. I, we just try they just travel what three thousand miles to California, and then came back home, 
And I don't know how how long is the flight to Florida? Five six hours? Mm, maybe three, four four three four. Yeah, I I don't know. I haven't been. So yeah, I think after ten games, if we we don't see some sort of changes, then we can maybe start uh, getting a little concerned. I don't know if New England fans will wait as long as you. Uh, <laughs> that doesn't mean that you're wrong. Um, but I can see that if we look at our if we look at our brothers to the north, that the pitchforks could come out a lot sooner than that. I have complete faith in this team still. I think this is an outlier, like you said. Um, it'll just time will tell. That being said, I'm not sold on the three five two. I, I think we really need to start exploring a, a four back line and and keep defensive composure. Um, and and let's be honest too, we haven't really talked about it, but we're in the middle of a kind of somewhat tough schedule. Right, all of the teams we face have some history or some higher pedigrees in the league. Uh, I think you know the battery coming into town is no exception. Riverhounds were next after that, maybe not so much after their showing, and then of course Vegas, but they're on the rise. And then we've got you know the likes of Phoenix Rising, North Carolina, and Sacramento. So this is just more par for the course. Um, and I think it's going to be it's going to be interesting to see how we kind of get through this part of the schedule before we come out the other side. That being said, we are one of four teams that still don't have a win in this league. It's crazy how we go from undefeated to winless in the course of a single match. It's funny how uh, when you've got a bunch of draws, you can be undefeated. Uh, as soon as you have a loss, it's you're winless. <laughs> it's the beauty of the sport. Just, yeah. <laughs> it's the beauty of the sport. So let's talk about Rhode Island taking on the battery this Saturday. Rhode Island is coming now off of its first loss. Uh, we've gotten that out of the way. Battery remain undefeated. And this is going to be a tale of can a Rhode Island FC side scrap together the stamina and the determination to get a win in front of their home fans as they take on this team. Battery are coming off of a recent win against the, the Miami FC with a questionable offside goal by like a solid five yards. Um, but when you look at the stats, they do tell a more complete picture of what this team is. They're basically dominating in every category. You don't want to see a successful team dominate in. They're the highest possession based team with effective possession, by the way, in both their own and final third of their opponents. Uh, when it comes to each half, uh, they have the highest accuracy of passes, uh, and not just in terms of pass distribution and accuracy, but also in long ball. And then, surprise or not surprise, they also have the best defensive stats as they lead the total number of clean sheets as well as the total number of fewest goals against. So if we thought Tampa Bay was tough, I I have to understand, or I have to ask you if you can help me understand, is this is this a trap game? Should we be preparing for the worst here? Or is this a is this a tale of maybe the battery haven't been playing opponents that are all that difficult so far in their schedule well they also did play a um new mexico united and they did kind of thrash them to a certain extent but weirdly enough tambacus did not play that match did you see that i did that was that was an odd choice you know this is this is what comes with the territory we're gonna have to be able to play against some of the best in the league if that is our goal as well, maybe we need a reality check. Maybe we need to get punched in the gut one more time, you know? <laughs> uh, but also, we're going to be at home. And looks like we might be bringing some New England weather to them. So I don't, I don't know if they're ready for this. Yeah, I mean, the original this game was supposed to be borderline snow and just heavy sheets of, of rain. And now it's looking like it's going to be a classic New England game with some rain during the match. So for those of you that are coming, it'll be light, but bring bring your rain gear out because it's going to be a wet day. The weather's constantly changing here. At one point this morning, I saw that Saturday was just clear. Checked again in a few hours and said, like, oh, I guess we're going to get some rain. Not a lot, but some. So let's talk about this lineup and, and what we can kind of expect from this game this week. So in, in terms of injuries, J.J. Williams still out. Amos Shapiro Thompson, until I hear otherwise, he's just out indefinitely. Uh, and then Coke Vegas, lots of questions if our, you know, if El Capitan is going to return. I saw some pictures from the club this week as they've released, you know, their practice sessions. I did not see Coke in any of them. 
And since no one from the club has confirmed that he's returning to the starting 11 or to the bench, I'm going to play it safe and assume that he's back when he's back. And so for now, my money is that Lee gets another start against this Charleston battery side. Uh, and if I'm wrong and Koke is here on Saturday, I, I just want to err on the side of caution. I haven't seen him in any of the the media uh, pictures that have gone out for distribution. So that tells me that probably he's maybe another week before he returns. Yeah, with the exception of Koke, I'm going to guess we're going to see a very similar lineup to Monterey Bay. So another three five two. Yeah, I, th- I think we'll we'll see something very similar to that. I guess actually I should say we'll probably... I think Clay's going to get in the starting lineup again, too. Hopefully in the midfield, though. So maybe not exactly the same lineup, but, you know, kind of similar to that. Do you think we go back to the same conversation we had about the Joe Brito, Clay Holstead, and Connor McGlynn triangle? Because, again, Joe Brito seems to, like we said, it, it seems like he either isn't finding the space to make a name for himself. And and sometimes it's the silent work of a midfielder, right? Like we've said Marky Barra is best when he's in a six or a, a silent eight role and not in this forced creation spot. I feel like Joe Brito may be suffering from that himself. So Joe stat wise actually is doing pretty well. He's one of the better players on the team. He's doing a lot of work that I think is going unnoticed in the uh, Monterey Bay game. I forget the exact number, but he had a significant amount of, um, I forget what the actual stat is, but like where he won the ball in their half, you know, he, he's, he's putting in some work. It's just, it's not the flashy stuff. He's not getting the assist or he's not making the, the amazing passes. He's just, he's out there working hard. So then does Clay go back to that left center back role or do we find a way to incorporate him into the midfield? I don't know. I mean, you know, you and a few other people have thought maybe maybe Mark Ibarra might might sit this one out, or at least on the bench, you know? I don't think you can bench Ibarra. If you bench him for one bad game, that destroys a player's confidence. Yeah, actually that's that's yeah, you're right. That's probably too harsh. I don't know. I I just I personally want to see Clay in the midfield. I don't know how you get him in there. Maybe you have to change the formation, but I just think that's where we can see him shine. So I I don't know how you how you do that. Maybe maybe actually Brito is the one. Maybe you push Connor farther forward, and maybe you, Brito is like a later sub. I, I, when legs are tired, I I think Connor is the centerpiece, and then Holstead and Ibarra working around him. It makes the most sense. I I think Clay is wasted in that left center back spot. Um, but again, I've said this for I think what five episodes now in a row I, i'm still waiting to see a four back line whether it's a four three three or a four four two I, I want us to 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 build from the back i want us to contain maintain shape and then and give linkage to the midfield i don't think fusan and chico need as much support as we're as we're pretending that they need it seems like if you can get a ball to them fusan's speed and class and chico's just durability like they can create a lot out of a very little and i think maybe we could see if we pulled that back a little bit at the same time and and understand what does that grant us from you know getting out in front for a game but then also maintaining it through the entire management of all 90 minutes that being said if they're going to continue the 352 experiment i also don't want to disrupt what coach is trying to cook because they need to get better and better if this is if this is the formation then they need every chance possible to make this work because going back and, and starting to roll the dice on different things, to me, that's a sign of panic where you're now trying to respond to the other team. You're trying to you're trying to say, I know my system doesn't work and I need to counter. Like if, if coach is just saving that four three three or four four two for whenever he sees fit, that's one thing. But if he's if he's hell bent on this, we need to we need to let him do what he needs to do to get these players ready for that. Yeah, I was actually going to echo that sentiment that if he does, as much as I would like to see a four three three two to see how that works, I feel like if this soon, if he changes from that, it it might be like admitting that the three five two is not is like a failure to a certain extent, right? I, like, can you go back to it after? I don't know if this is what he wants to do. It you know also three back lines in USL Championship are in vogue right now. A lot of the teams are playing them. So, and they do, to a certain extent, if played well, 
they can line up well against other three back lines and at times even counter them. So we know that the Charleston battery will most likely favor the 4-2-3-1. That is what they've been playing all season so far with some small iterations. Ben Pierman knows what he's doing with this team. He got them to the finals last year. You know, he's a player. He's a player's coach. He knows how to bring out the best in players. Who who are this who are the people that Rhode Island FC fans should be watching for on the pitch this Saturday? Uh Mark Markanich, I think I Nick Markanich said that right. Nick Markanich. Yeah, Markanich. Yeah, he uh he's a dangerous one. Uh he's when I was watching some of the game against uh New Mexico United, he's constantly finding himself in good positions and testing the goalkeeper and getting other teammates into good positions as well too. He he seems like a threat. That did you see that Aaron Malloy free kick? Oh man, that was that was good. So yeah, and you're spot on with Malloy. I mean, he's definitely created the main attacking threat for Charleston Battery this year. Uh the Irishman is leading the league in accurate passes and long balls. So I said earlier that Charleston Battery was leading the league. Well, this is the individual that's bringing those stats into frame. So I would anticipate on top of free kicks like what you saw in that highlight, uh, the, a lot of attack and chance creation is going to be generated through his his vision and his passing sequences. Um, and, and then, of course, that perfectly combines with the likes of the other midfielder you have to watch out for, which is Arturo Rodriguez. And, you know, if Malloy is the engine who can distribute and make those passing sequences come to life, Rodriguez is the guy you don't want with the ball at his feet. Because he'll show you just how dangerous he can be, not only in his dribbling, which leads the league, but in finding those you know little passes that make that extra something happen to connect with the assist or score a goal of his own. Uh, this is a team that's going to take it to Rhode Island FC and show them the business end of what a soccer match can look like. Yeah, it's uh, not looking great for us, maybe. <laughs> you know, I, I think that after this last match, I, I think that they're going to show up. You know, I don't know if we're going to come out with a win, but I believe that uh, we're going to bring the fight to them. So is this is this a team, again, I, I said it earlier, not knowing what the likelihood of, of who they've played and the quality of that, and you mentioned New Mexico United, but I have to ask, is it right to be worried? Is it not 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 for the season, but just knowing that Charleston Battery are going to make it a difficult time here at Bryant? The team is still searching for a, a first w- victory, and and they'd want to obviously now do it in front of the of in front of the fans. Is is this something that's going to cause problems for Rhode Island FC on Saturday? I imagine so, but at the same time, it it kind of depends how you look at it. You could say that. Early on, this is a good test, um, and maybe later on, when we, we if we run into them again, you know, maybe by then we'll kind of have everything figured out because the team is still finding its feet. I, I I think we had said early on that this team could find themselves trying to battle through some difficult opponents early, and then seeing how they could reverse that momentum in the back half of the season. Obviously, you don't want them to have to do that. You want them to gain momentum and maintain momentum. But this was something that we always had as a a watch out or a concern. So having said that, what does Rhode Island FC need to do to get it right for this game and come out with the win? So I think realistically that they need to stick to the plan. You know, three three games in is not time to panic. Um, I don't think they should start reinventing the wheel. I I would say this last match wasn't great, but the first two, there was, there's definitely something there. And if the balls went different ways, we could have easily won either, if not both of those matches. Chico Albertiqua is on a goal scoring run. So I think we need to get, keep getting the ball to him. Strikers often work harder defensively when, when they're being given service. They sometimes can be isolated so make sure that he feels like he is part of the team and he will uh, kind of get himself more into the match there. Like We've seen even a few times when if he's lost the ball, like you can tell he feels feels bad about it and he will track them back all the way into our own box. 
the team is probably a bit down now. And this, this one actually, I'd say, is more on us. Like second home match, I think that we need to make sure that we get behind the team. That defiance, you know, shows up and gives their support, and we don't, you know, be too hard on them. I I agree with you. I I think that, and I love that you assigned us responsibilities. It's not just the team now, so the fans yeah. now have <laughs> have ownership here. Um, I listen. I defense, defense, defense. I I, I want a four back line. Uh, I know that that can be divisive right now, especially with what Kano is trying to do with the formation he has. Uh, but I want to see this team get more comfortable with the ball at their feet and not rush. You know, one of the things that we saw about a non-existent midfield was that in the transition, we didn't have good linkages between the back line and the forwards and the midfield who were also playing extremely far forward. So you saw those long balls. And if we didn't, if we didn't get the header, if we didn't get the deflection and start an attack, it looked like we weren't in control. I'm not saying that they have to play out the back per se, but I'd love that this team takes a little bit more time to be compact, to be comfortable. You know, the last goal that Damian Rivera scored, it was a header. It was a defensive header that they tried to clear back to to Lee. It didn't have enough, you know, mustard on it, so it fell to Rivera's feet. Why didn't we just head the ball forward? Well, I think we knew that there was no midfield to contain that ball either, so either way... We were kind of in that, you know, you you stuck between the rock and the hard place. So I'd like to see this team kind of make it the order of the day to get the clean sheet. And if that means it's a nil-nil game, I would rather see that and, and have this team show fans, show themselves that they can be defensive and, and show up big defensively than to just say that the order of the day is to outscore the other team. I'd like to see some better defensive-minded efforts, especially around the set-piece composure. It was, again, more of the struggle as one of the goals led to that this week as well. So I'd like to see that defense uh, kind of shine greater than any goal scoring or offense that we see on the day. And then I kind of want to see the last one is this midfield. I don't think anyone's sold necessarily yet on Connor McGlynn, Joe Brito, Marky Barra, Clay Holstead. I'd like to see us get better at defining what we think that midfield would be, you know, and, and if it's not, if it is a combination of the players we just mentioned, great. If it's something else, that's fine too. But I think, you know, again, our problems at defense will get solved by figuring out that midfield at the same time. Um, it cannot be more of what we saw because offensive final third possession will, will not get us where we need to be at the end, unless we are outscoring like to the likes of four, one, the other way. And I haven't seen that yet from from the Rhode Island FC side. Yeah, I think that's fair. Uh, so, with that being said, what's your uh, prediction for the match? We in the rankings, you still have one point for for guessing. You know, matches, and I'm still at zero. I I, I this battery team is either it's a, either they're fluky and they are lucky with their wins, and I hope that's the case. But I I just don't see us getting a win against Charleston this weekend. I think that there's too many unanswered uh, problems that we will need at least one or two more games to work through. Uh, maybe if we were playing the likes of Las Vegas Lights or the Riverhounds who we face next, then maybe I would say we could get the win out. And But I, I just, unless Coach has been putting them through just an exhaustive uh, training regiment this week, I, I, I don't know that you can you can get an answer that you need against a quality team that fast because we haven't shown defensive composure yet and, and being able to close out games. So I think it's going to be a little bit more of the same, but with some less damage on it, I think it's going to be a, a one, two battery win. And again, if I'm wrong, that means we either tied and got a point or we won. And so I, I feel like I win here through reverse <laughs> psychology, but I, I just don't see us. I, I think we're getting closer. I'm not worried. I'm not even near a panic button. I just don't know if the guys um, figured it out in the last, you know, five, six days. I, uh, you know, I'm going crazy. I'm going to say we're going to win 2-1. I think it's too early at this point for me to, like, predict us to lose because I still feel to a certain extent that we are somewhat of enigma. I think that we could just turn up and just, we could win. So I'm, I'm going to have faith. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say 2-1. Hey, listen, I hope you're right. I really do. I really do. Um, 
So, hey, we're having a massive amount of internet problems tonight, uh, which maybe in the power of editing people won't necessarily know. So we're going to try to get to these listener questions. But if we don't let read yours out, we had them all on the table. But for the sake of time, it's just it's like every five seconds the internet dies in this hotel I'm at. So um, if we don't get to it, please don't think we ignored you. We just we're going to have to push through it. So uh, first question or first comment is Nate writes in thanks for the sticker love listening to the show on youtube how can we expand the watch party experience for all someone mentioned compassed zoned areas like a north south east west central for those that can't make it to the headquarters what are your thoughts yeah so i think the guild is you know going forward always going to be defiance's main like watch party um we had mentioned that in different parts of the state that are within 12 minute radiuses can maybe like have their own watch parties. It's, you know, a lot of this depends on somewhat the fans in terms of, is there a demand for this? We'll find out. Yeah. I, I think, I think each time a, a spot has a watch party, like we alluded to at the beginning, you'll see more interest. Maybe it's not official, but you'll see three fans come together. I mean, that's how these usually start, right? If they're not driven by the club or the supporters group, it's just people getting together in a place they're familiar with and and watching a game. Yeah, I mean, if, you know, people make friends with other fans and just kind of figure out where where everybody's living, kind of go online, make a Facebook invite or whatever it is you guys want to do and just say, hey, let's meet up and watch the game here. Yep. Evan writes in, uh, I mentioned this on the Quahog Corner, but how realistic could R- would it be for RFC to deploy a 4-2-3-1? Uh, that's, that's kind of a tactics kind of question. I think we have the players to do it, but is that what Coach wants? I don't know. I mean, a 4-2-3-1 is a, is a different version of a 4-3-3. You know, maybe just you pull one of those three back into the the two and push the other ones forward they're just kind of variations of each other um you just have maybe different like different like width for different positions generally a four two three one if i'm it's used like three cams right so i think we are a little bit more of a winger team so four through three kind of makes more sense for us because those the the three behind the striker in a, in a four two three one are supposed to be more players like um, like Micheletto from uh, New Mexico, right? Someone who wants to hold the ball and pass it around, or like a David Silva, you know. It or it, it I don't think it really suits us, you know. Uh, Matthew Davis here wants to know if we don't see a win in the match against Charleston. What needs to be done? Change formation, put other players in, panic. Haven't been too impressed with Brito and Ibarra. Don't understand why Ibarra takes all the free kicks and corners as far as I can tell. You know, it's it's a good question. I, 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 We don't even know who our penalty taker is. We don't really know much on why people are in the roles they're in. Uh, it's too small of a sample size so far. I, I would say if Ibarra is taking the free corners free corners wow free kicks and corners it could be a height thing he's one of the shorter players on the squad so if you're putting balls into the box you know you want the likes of your tallest players in there to try to put head on it i i don't think he he's done anything like wrong in terms of the those free kicks i think he's put them into generally good positions we've seen the team create decent amount of chances and then you want players like for instance, when McGlynn is is on the field, you'd want him to be able to try and get on the end of one of those crosses. And like you mentioned, he he is maybe one of the shorter guys. Um, you know, things just aren't have been going our way. So it's, you know, I I understand why people want to kind of point fingers, especially when we've seen glimpses of of what we know this team can do. Um, and there's there's a lot of stuff that goes on behind the scenes and training that we just don't see and we aren't privy to. So I I would still trust Connor's judgment on this. Yeah, I I don't, I, and it's not panic. I don't know if ten games. You know, if you have ten losses, I would say that there's a panic that needs to happen before that. Um, I don't know what the magic number to panic is, but it needs to be at least five games before we even discuss it. 
And then I think it needs to be like, are we seeing progress? If we're seeing progress and we're seeing the team come together, then that can take time. You know, we all were very high on this group because we're all obsessed with it. But everyone coming into the league has warned us, do not set your expectations that high. It's the hope that will kill. And I think, you know, that if we see some things not go our way over the next couple of weeks, that's that, you know, law of averages or returning to the mean of understanding that, hey, this is this is a learning curve, even with the experience that we bring in and uh, getting ourselves situated to be contenders down the stretch. So uh, I don't know. I, I'm a 4-3-3 guy. So you're asking if I want to change the formation. I wanted to change the formation three games ago. So it's a good question, Matthew. Um, but I'd say this, we got to give it more time. Um, other Matthew, Matthew Jean asks, there have been three starting lineups now, all different for three games, once healthy or close to healthy to this as this team can get. Do you see a potential starting 11 that will be rolled out with any consistency? Um, yeah, that, that's hard to say. I, I don't think we really know the answer to that until we have a good run of games where everyone is healthy. All right, coach has to have everyone available and be able to cycle through those permutations of of his available assets and kind of see what it is that he really wants. I imagine when he was constructing this team, he probably had some sort of vision. But at the same time, as we've now started to play and he's getting more familiar with his players' attributes, that may have changed. It's just, you know, what JJ won't be ready for at least a few, like another month. So maybe in the summer, we'll start to get an idea of what it is that coach really wants. I just hope that before then we start to see some better results. And Kevin here is asking about um, a similar kind of question to Matthew Davis about maybe some performances of people. I don't, I don't want to pile on players too much um, in terms of expectations. I, I think that was just a rough match in Tampa Bay and it's leaving a lot of people feeling, um, you know, it's the, it's the New it. England, it's the New England way, <laughs> specifically the Rhode Island way. Listen, and, and I think you're right. I don't know that I could say if you string together all three matches, if you can find a common denominator where there's one single player that's had a lack of uh, performance across all three matches that would say, you know, why is he still in the starting 11 or why is he going on to the pitch? I think there's been mistakes made by players separately in each match uh, and it's individual to that moment in time. I, I think that Joe Brito, because his name has come up multiple times tonight, you know, if you look at Joe didn't have the mistakes that Ibarra had. But there seems to be more conversation on the likes of Brito. And like Jason said, you know, statistically, he's putting in the work. You're just not seeing it with your eyeballs on the pitch. And this will always be a conversation of what do the stats say and what does your what do your eyes say? I you you just have to understand that he's doing what he is needed to do. Otherwise, coach would not continue to put him in that position of responsibility. If we had an upgrade, and this is where the Holstead conversation comes in, if we had an upgrade to move that across, then we could consider it. But like right now, if Holstead is the upgrade, then let's talk about it. But if he's not, you know, Joe Brito coming from USL League One, if we have promotion relegation, the League One team would have moved up you know, into into championship play potentially. So like the barrier or the, the separation between these two talents, I'm not sure it's that wide of a gap. Um, but, you know, every every player is going to have the people that love them and every player is going to have the people that don't. And uh, I think I think it's too early to, to put any, you know, to get out any pitchforks. I, I just don't see that Joe deserves the ire yet that he's getting. He, yeah, he, he's been in all the matches so far. Um, and like you said, we, we've maybe been critical of moments, kind of mistakes that people have had, but no one, none of our players have had like consistent, you know, bad performances. It's just maybe either a part of a, part of a match they weren't playing too well, or they made a, a mistake that unfortunately led to a goal. I don't think any of these players, like we need to get the pitchforks out, like you said, and 
try and run them away from the team. I, I think that they're all here for a reason. Kano sees, you know, sees something in them. And we've also, it, if we're being real with ourselves, we've all seen moments from all these different players where they've shown us that, you know, they deserve to be here. It's just, you know, when you build a team from nothing, you know, some of these guys know each other, but they've not all played together. Yeah. No, I, I, I'm expecting I'm expecting this team to come alive, and maybe it's in this game up ahead, and maybe it's in one in the future. But I, I'm I'm not here to to have my mind permanently set in stone on anyone just yet. So, you want to get us uh, give get the fans knowing what's going on next and get us out of here. Yeah. So RAFC will be back home at Bryant Stadium this Saturday, April sixth, squaring off against the Charleston Battery for their first Eastern Conference matchup. The game is at 7.30 p.m. with gates opening at 4.30 p.m. If you can't attend the game, it'll be available on Nessun. And as a reminder, RIFC is set to host the Pittsburgh Riverhounds on Saturday, April 13th at 7.30 p.m. Ahead of its midweek Open Cup matchup with uh, Charlotte Independence on Tuesday, April 16th. And then they'll be embarking on another cross-country road trip to meet up with the likes of the Las Vegas Lights on Saturday, April 20th at 8 p.m. Thank you guys for bearing with us on this uh, hotel internet disconnection pod. Um, you can catch we, we us get, online. We, we get one bad one too, right? Like <laughs> yeah. Rhode Island FC gets a 4-1 loss. We get like a 40 internet connection break to one clean feed. <laughs> it feels like we've been trying to record this like hour pod for four hours. I think, I think it's like four hour mark. Yeah, I'm not even lying. Oh. Anyways, get us out of here. <laughs> All right, guys, you can find us on Twitter, Threads, and TikTok at RAFC Podcast, Instagram at Raising Anchor, and that website, www.raisinganchorpodcast.com. Can't wait to see you all at the game on Saturday, and Anchor's Up. Anchor's Up. <laughs>